this time. Thank you so much for being a part of us. My name is Mandatim Lodja. I'm your host today and I'm co-hosting with my colleague, Jeffrey Smith. Jeff, how are you today? I am good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. So for those that are joining us for the first time again, the Resistance Bureau basically focuses on issues surrounding democracy, human rights, and the struggle for freedom in Africa. It's a program that seeks to spotlight some of the leaders that are at the forefront of this ongoing fight and seeks to build solidarity among them. So in event for you today, prominent African speakers were helping us to unpack what happens to liberation movements when they win power and why promises of freedom and development often go unnoticed and also unfulfilled. I'll speak an icon of the struggle for freedom in South Africa. Manuel, an elected mayor from Mozambique, who's the leading figure within the main opposition party, Vinamo. Betty Nambuz, a Ugandan MP who has been regularly imprisoned and tortured for the winning party, as well as Maureen Kademaunga, a leader of the movement for democratic change in Zimbabwe. Lives have been destroyed by the violence meted out by the ruling party, ZANU-PF, in Zimbabwe. Also joining us today as a discussant is Nicole Beardsworth, a brilliant analyst who has conducted research in Zimbabwe, in Zambia and Uganda, alongside our colleague, Nick Chisman, who will be running the Q&A session as usual. Welcome to the Resistance Bureau, Nicole. Great to see you again, Nick. So for those that are interested in the more biographical details of today's participants, please visit our website, which is www.theresistancebureau.com. You can also catch up with our previous episodes, as well as just discover what the Resistance Bureau is, our guiding principles, and the plan that we have going forward. And for today's program, you can this discussion by following us on Twitter, at Resist Bureau, as well as using the hashtag Resist Bureau Live. We're currently streaming on Facebook Live as well as on YouTube, and we're recording this show for later distribution. So I'm just going to hand it over to Jeff for a brief introduction of today's topic. Thank you so much, Mantade, and thanks to everyone who has joined us today, uh, including our many first-time viewers and, of course, our speakers and discussants. On today's program, we're going to turn our attention to the liberation movements that have played a hugely important role in overthrowing authoritarian and abusive political systems across the African continent, including racist white minority regimes in Namibia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. They also have unbelievable staying power and relevance in 2021. To this day, no African liberation movement has ever lost power in an election, an undefeated record that spans decades and dozens of polls in many countries. Originally, these liberation movements are often branded as struggles for human freedom from both political and economic repression. Think of the Freedom Charter adopted by the African National Congress in 1955. In many cases, liberation leaders promised to build more inclusive and egalitarian political systems that would empower ordinary citizens and build a more prosperous and economically vibrant future for their country, often in a spirit of collaboration and built on a foundation of Pan-Africanism. Today, however, these ideals have not been realized in the vast majority of cases. While the African National Congress in South Africa has sustained political rights and civil liberties since coming to power in 1994, it has also become mired in repeated corruption scandals and allegations of mismanagement. The situation is considerably worse in Zimbabwe, where the ZANU-PF government initially won plaudits for its economic management in the 1980s, but has since become one of the most repressive and truly exploitative regimes on the entire continent. These disappointing themes seem to point to common features of African liberation movements, namely their need to institutionalize hierarchy and secrecy, as well as the use of political violence to achieve their ultimate goals. And in turn, this may shape the kinds of governments they ultimately establish after attaining power. After all, leaders and organizations do not simply change their mindsets and methods the second they enter statehouse. It is easy to change military uniforms for civilian garb, of course, but it is much harder to instill a democratic culture, its norms and values. This phenomenon reflects a broader trend in which rebel armies from Angola to Rwanda and Uganda, to name but a few, have failed to break free from their militaristic backgrounds and so have been unwilling or unable to foster pluralistic and civilian systems of government. In this show today, we will unpack why some liberation movements become highly authoritarian, top-down regimes that are intolerant of any opposition. We will also interrogate what we may learn from those that have bucked this trend and how we can resist the slide towards political repression. Is this merely inevitable or can the tide be effectively turned? Of course, we will want to hear from what all of you in the audience think about these important issues. So 
please have your say by sending a note to our WhatsApp number. We posted it on social media, but the number for those listening today is plus two, six, three, seven, seven, six, two, three, eight, one, nine, nine. We have a really busy agenda today. So Mentade, let's dive in and get started, shall we? Totally. Thank you so much, Jeff. So Jay, I'm going to come to you first because you've played an important role in the fight for multiracial democracy in South Africa. Many outside of South Africa actually view the country as a positive example, a stable transition that has not collapsed into authoritarian rule. But when you look at South Africans, they don't see it that way and some feel betrayed by the ANC. So why is there such a discrepancy and how do you evaluate the party's record in power having been there from the very beginning? I believe the challenge of politics in South Africa is, in fact, a microcosm of politics in the world. You know, what happens when a a revolutionary liberation movement decides to eat its children, basically? You know, paper accepts everything that is written on it. So, you know, I mean, we talked of great ideals that would inspire us. The Freedom Charter was a process in which the desires, the aspirations, the, the goals of our liberation movement were, were, were set not in, in conference rooms with academics and, and activists, but at a grassroots movement where people participated in shaping what they believe should replace apartheid. And that process in, uh, in, in, in the period in the 90s elaborated into the reconstruction and development movement uh, and, and, and program. And that came out of the, of the trade union movement because you know, I was general secretary of the most militant and largest trade union movement in, in, in the country, in, in the country's history. It was the backbone of the struggle. And together with many other organizations involved in mass struggle within the country, it built a, a, a momentum that eventually paralyzed the apartheid state. So unlike liberation movements in many other parts of Africa, you know, while we had an armed struggle, it was not the decisive factor that brought us freedom. It's it was the, the struggles of ordinary people fighting in terms of resisting apartheid and saying, we've had enough. So the, the route to power was significantly different, even though it had components of a liberation movement, but it was the vibrancy of, of the, the people and their struggles. And I think like all liberation movements and like all political parties, once you get into power, then the dynamics change, change in the sense that you are now the state and you know, coming out of an ideological position where the state is responsible for the delivery of the better life we promised our people in 1994, the state-driven process in fact marginalizes people. People become bystanders. And then in a, in a moment where the, the gigantic momentum of struggle by ordinary people and the participatory democracy becomes captured by elites. And so, yes, you know, we went to an apartheid state and we sought to transform it and we did transform aspects of it, but we ended up where a political party in transitioning from a liberation movement becomes well, the representative of a more elitist part of our society. And that's what happened. And so, you know, we we have a situation where political party in any political party anywhere in the world, its goal doesn't become to serve people, it goal becomes to stay in power. And so a process of marginalization and alienation from the people emerges. And that's what's, you know, I, I think that confounds us and, and, and sets us back in politics across the world. So I think today, particularly given the technological revolution, given the context that has changed, given the history that liberation may have brought us the right to vote, but it did not, it, it did not e- equal to the material improvement in lives of people, young people are saying, we don't trust you. We don't trust your generation. We don't trust politics. We don't trust democracy. We don't trust your struggles for even human rights because you have betrayed us. And so if you look at South Africa, 
where one in three is, is hungry, one in three is unemployment, unemployed, and one in three living on a social grant, there's legitimate anger about it because inequality has grown. And so I think we have to ask ourselves a more fundamental question. What is politics today? Why do young people not feel compelled to join the trade union movement or even register to vote? You know, half the young people in South Africa don't even bother to register to vote. Do you blame them for that? Or do you ask those that are in power, including ourselves that have been in power before, what did we do wrong? And what do we need to change in the politics going forward? Otherwise, we will repeat the cycle of trauma, of alienation, of exclusion that today dominates the world. So, Thank you so much, Jay. Um, you know, I, I think it's really fitting that we're, we're talking to you today of all days, right? Which is of course, Freedom Day uh, in South Africa. Um, for those who are watching, it's a day that commemorates the country's first uh, post-apartheid elections. And you talked very eloquently about um, how the dynamics of power change and how it becomes a state-driven process which marginalizes and, and tends to alienate people. So I want to ask you about the transitions of power and the, straight, the state driven processes we've seen in South Africa, because in very different ways, Presidents Thabo and Becky and, and Jacob Zuma, for instance, were both determined to centralize power under the presidency and both were very hostile to criticism as, as we saw. Um, so I'd like to get your thoughts on, you know, what might this tell us about the ANC, its history as a liberation movement, that these were the leaders that followed immediately in the footsteps of Nelson Mandela, who today is still, of course, lionized as one of the continent's greatest and most consequential leaders. You were there at the very beginning. Um, so I think your insight is crucial here. would love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, I think the history of the ANC is very significant in understanding politics, you know, that it's no liberation movement of political parties homogeneous. There are many contesting factions. And the question, is there a progressive faction that remains in power? And so I think, it's particularly with Mandela, the Mandela generation, what was their mandate? You know, their mandate was to deliver political liberation and ensure that we create a safe container of a constitutional democracy where we'd have the levers of power to address economic apartheid or social apartheid to be able to level the playing fields. That was the intention. And we had that power. The question is, do we blame Mandela? And often this narrative is what sort of percolates to the top, is Mandela sold us out. Well, in any transition anywhere in the world, even within your family, even between your relationship with your partner, there's always negotiations, there are always compromises. I can't think I've been in negotiations all my life. I can't think, I negotiate my grandson who I had to put to bed just now about going to bed so I can participate in the show. So that is it, we are in a constant state of negotiations and compromise. But there's no ways one can say the fact that we stepped back from a precipice of a racial civil war, which the whole world was predicting. And we rose above the conflict and we found common ground from divergent positions, diametrically opposed positions where the National Party was fighting for veto rights. And we were saying, no, there's no way we were going to agree to anything beside one person, one vote in a non-racial, non-sexist, democratic South Africa. And that's what we want. Now you have people that have squandered the power we have, and which has become very much self-serving, and then want to blame those that created the democracy. And that's, you know, for me, that's, that's, you know, false, you know, it's a falsehood. So yes, we wish we had walked, you know, marched into Pretoria on the back of tanks carrying an ANC flag. We didn't. We got the best negotiation and the most progressive constitution one can find in the world anywhere. What have we done with that in 27 years? And so for me, I look at it and think, well, I'm grateful to a Mandela. I'm, I, 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 you know, if you want to talk about mistakes that I made, and I was part of, we'll have to spend the whole program talking about it. So why don't we acknowledge that not just as South Africa, but as a humanity, we today face a crisis 
It's an ecological emergency where the science is telling us, even if you don't believe people, the science is telling us we literally have 12 years in which to change our trajectory as human. An emergency and a crisis created by our human greed. So my advice to young people today is you question everything. You question everything. You hold everyone to account, whether it's a trade union leader, leader or an NGO leader, or whether it's you know, a political leader or a billionaire, you question them all. And that's your right. Because we cannot you know, fool around and you know, around the edges of a debate. We need to be firm. And I me mean, as an elder, I've said to young people in Africa, we will stand behind you. I'll make sure that I get elders that stand behind you because you are the present leaders, leaders of Africa. You're not the future leaders. And we need to get away from this notion that power needs to sit in the hands of baby boomers, where most of our leaders are today probably in their 70s. They should be like me, you know, putting a grandchildren to bed and pass the damn baton to younger people with greater imagination that can put behind them worn out ideologies and NGOism that has created a professionalized civil, you know, bureaucracy that is as much part of the problem as part of the solution of a political party that generally in every part I've seen has become bureaucratized, institutionalized and actually the worst enemy of democracy. So the question really is we had the most exciting moment of our lives as a human race because we have to rethink everything, reimagine everything. We should be inspired. I wish I was 40 years younger to be an organizer. There's discontent in the world. What are you waiting for? Build a world that really will be a legacy we want to hand over to the next generation and the future generations. Let's think intergenerationally, not the selfishness that we have of this generation that I am part of, the arrogance of it. And that's what really troubles me. And that's why I don't spend too much time with people my age. You know, they don't inspire me. They always want to be diplomatically correct and bullshit protocols that they want in place to recognize what they did. Who cares what we did in the past? It's what we do today, what we stand for today that is important. And that's where I'm saying we should be calling out what is the truth we want. A system is broken globally. We don't have to do anything for it to collapse. What we should be discussing is what replaces it. Similar to the discussion we had in the antipathy struggle when we were in the trenches and we, they were blowing up the head office of the organization, Kosato. We were planning what will replace apartheid, even if we thought at that moment that many of us wouldn't be there. That's what we should be concentrating on. Something that puts ecology at the center of everything, that puts the compassion, the generosity, the interconnection, the indivisibility of humanity at the center, the, to find that Mandela within us, not look for some damn messiah. We don't need any more messiahs. We need to all stand up as seven and a half billion human beings and say, we've had enough of greed, of inequality, Thank you, Jay, for, for your candor and for, for your eloquence. And I think talking about passing the baton to the next generation, Maureen, I think it's a good time to, to pivot to you here because you are um, a part of that next generation. And of course, as we've been talking about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Zimbabwe's liberation struggle and how that was initially seen to have achieved the kind of negotiated and stable political transition that we were just discussing in regards to South Africa. But of course, it's we, we've seen the slide into repression and the chilling political violence that we continue to see today splashed across uh, global media. Um, so, Maureen, I'd really be interested in your thoughts on what you think caused this radical change in the modus operandi of, of ZANU-PF, for instance, or, or was violence always central to the way that the movement and later the party maintained control? Uh, would love to get your, your insights on that. Oh, thank, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to this very insightful discussion. Um, I think Jay mentioned something very important when he says that when he was 
uh, the general secretary of COSATU and when he was organizing lab, the labor movement in COSATU, their main focus on, was on what they would do to build a system that would uh, replace apartheid. This is exactly what was happening in Zimbabwe. I think um, in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, ZAPU and uh, ZANU-PF both were seized with the idea of wanting to replace, you know, the white minority rule with, uh, with, with, with something that is more inclusive. But what we get in 1980, um, I think when they went to, to the liberation war with this good intention, they did not actually budget for the cost of a democratic transition. So what we get in 1980 is that um, immediately, soon after independence, there's, there's you know, a relation of the party with the state that is problematic. Everyone who was like fighting in the war of liberation and the Bush came back and was, um, was, 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 was absorbed into uh, you know, the national army. And uh, then whoever else had just gotten an education and uh, was part of the liberation struggle was deployed into state departments, uh, you know, the, the judiciary and, and whatever else. So for me, right at the start of um, independence, there they happened a conflation of you know, the state and the party. And it's been very difficult to differentiate the two. And I think also the economic trajectory that the party then took in 1980 was, um, was a reaction of their lack of preparedness in terms of uh, you know, funding the democratic transition. They then just went to a position where they became very selfish and uh, sought to you know, uh, just uh, try and, uh, um, and, 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 and and compensate themselves if you want. So um, because they didn't have a plan, I, and I believe they didn't have a plan outside trying to protect power and to replace the white minority. Uh, as late as the 1980s, we had them already uh, having these uh, the, uh, 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 economic structural adjustment pro programs being forced on them by Bretton Woods institutions because they did not have their own uh, plan is into what would be the economic trajectory, trajectory and what would be their relation to state in terms of wanting to include everyone. And I think because of this, uh, the, the, the state party conflation and the relationship of the Sanu PF uh, party that came from the liberation war with the society became very problematic because people had high aspirations. The aspirations were, were exactly what Jay is speaking about, that we must build uh, a system that works for everyone, that is inclusive, that, that uh, promotes gender justice, that promotes um, non-racialism, ETC. But they then did not focus on that, but focused on just feeding themselves. And immediately soon after the war, I think two, three years into uh, independence, we already had people in, the, in, 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 in uh, Zapu, uh, which was uh, being led by Joshua Nkomo. I think we had people in Zapu already starting to question uh, the trajectory that Mugabe had chosen. And in response, we then uh, decided to, in response, we decided to deal with these people, use violence. Uh, and, and this is just really the story for us to independence. What we feel is that the regime in Zimbabwe does not tolerate political difference, does not tolerate, um, does not tolerate um, new ideas, does not tolerate the leadership of young people that Jay is talking about. So since 1980, they just decided they are not going to fund the democratic transition, but rather fund their pockets and then suppress the people. And uh, we've had a very, very long and uh, dark history of oppression where people are abducted, people are tortured, people have home raids and uh, are made to disappear without trace. Um, I think as recent as 2016, we had an activist in the name of Pat, um, uh, uh, Itai Zamara disappearing without stress uh, simply because the regime is trying to entrench itself and to make sure that uh, it, 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 it uh, just funds its entrenchment rather than the democratic transition. And I think the biggest problem we have at the core of this um, uh, 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 abusive relationship between San pf and the people where zanu -PF is using the state to repress uh, the citizens. I think the, the biggest problem we have is that they're holding on to this idea. I think two ideas. Number one, an idea that uh, there's an incomplete project of liberation 
that only them as ZANU PF can, can fulfill. They don't think that any other Zimbabwean who does not belong to ZANU PF has a say in the um, in the journey towards, you know, a, 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 a just and equal society. They believe that them as ZANU PF is an incomplete project of uh, lib liberation that they only can uh, fulfill. And the second thing is that they totally believe that uh, there's a continuous, uh, you know, uh, threat by some malevolent forces within uh, the society who are being funded by the West, who are being funded by the former colonizer to derail whatever they call, uh, you know, this liberation struggle of theirs. It's not only in Zimbabwe. When you listen to the ANC speak about uh, the issue of economic emancipation and national nationalization of mines, nationalization of uh, farms, ETC, it is coming from that idea that the liberation uh, movements believe that they are the only ones who are qualified to appropriately sanction what must be done and appropriately, uh, appropriately sorry, uh, complete the project of liberalization. To them, it's not complete. And to them, uh, the West remains uh, a threat. And to them, the opposition political parties who are organizing within uh, Zimbabwe, within South Africa, within uh, uh, Namibia, ETC, are a threat because they believe they're being uh, you know, used by European forces to uh, to to perpetuate uh, uh, colonialism, and for me that is very problematic because the moment you clarify or you classify people as uh, enemies rather than a political, uh, you know, people with different political ideas and whom you are contesting with, it's at a level of political contestation, then it becomes very problematic because you then justify the use of force, which is what happens in Zimbabwe. Because to them, every human rights activist, every uh, political activist, and anyone else with dissent uh, is being funded by uh, the former colonizers and is threatening mm. uh, the mm. sovereignty of Zimbabwe. And for me, that's very, very problematic because then it then justifies the use of force and the use of violence. In Zimbabwe, we've seen, uh, you know, like I've said earlier on, uh, in the 1980s, we had uh, the regime already dissenting uh, violently on people in uh, predominantly in the Matebeleland region, but only for the reason that they held different political views and that they wanted the regime to go back to the aspirations of those who started the liberation war to say that we must have a system that is inclusive, that does not look at black or white, but uh, a, a, that looks at everyone as equal before the law. So they, 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 uh, they started uh, with uh, the, you know, this violent attack uh, on people predominantly living in the region in Matebele land uh, in an episode known as the Kukra of Wundi. And after that, we've seen so many other episodes. Uh, I think in the late 90s, we had uh, the national strikes that were led by labor. Um, and even uh, during the liberation struggle, part of why they went to war was because uh, people who were working in farms, who were working in mines, and who were working in the cities were not getting, uh, you know, their labor rights. And the labor movement was such an important aspect of, of the liberation war. But in the 90s, late 90s, we saw the regime turning against those people and butchering them and making I think we may have lost Maureen Mentade. Are, are you still with us? Oh. Seems we, we've lost a few folks. Uh, Manuel, uh, are you are you able to hear us? Are you still with us as well? All right. I think what we'll do is Betty, if if you can hear us and you're still with us, um, you know, I, I'd love to to come to you. Um, is everything okay on your end? You can hear me okay. Hello. Perfect. Hi, Betty. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, I think given this discussion, we've been talking a lot about Southern Africa and in Zimbabwe and in South Africa in particular. And it sort of leads to my question that Uganda is often treated as if it's in different category from these other liberation movements in Southern Africa, those we have been discussing today. But I've I've seen you sort of following the discussion and 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 nodding your head in agreement as as you were listening to other speakers. Um, so I was wondering if you know what we've heard today. 
from, from Jay, for instance, uh, and, and from Maureen in Zimbabwe, what they're saying, does this resonate with your lived experiences in Uganda? Um, in other words, are, are politics in Uganda today also shaped by, by the legacy of the Bush war that Museveni fought back in the 1980s? And if so, how? And, and if so, what does this mean for the future of the country as you see it? We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. Uh, greetings from Uganda. I'm joining you people of great experience. Uh, yes, I nodded my head in agreement uh, with uh, the story I was hearing from Zimbabwe about uh, the blackmail that is raised as an excuse by uh, the bad leaders of Africa, that whenever the group of people they say that they are agents of the period. So when she mentioned it really, um, I, I thought as if she was really talking about him. And, and it is quite sad. Um, if you listen to these stories, from South Africa, Zimbabwe, to Uganda, to Southern Sudan, through Somalia and Libya. And it is the same story of strong man, strong men, as opposed to strong institutions. And um, the liberators, and we the liberated, and the need ever. To, to go for another liberation war. What I want to suggest is that whether we learn to replace the gun with a fair about box, the day we shall celebrate democracy, the human rights and freedom on the continent. In Uganda, and I do hope that this story is known by many people, but you'll allow me to repeat it for, for reference, for ease of reference. Please do. In 1980, we had an election, an election which preceded a war uh, that was made at a fought by Tanzania on behalf of Ugandans to overthrow Idi Amin. A consensus president was agreed on by the people who were in the most Tanzania, that was Yusuf Kiron de Rule. But he was removed from office in 68 days of his regime. And those were the forefront of that approach to overthrow a consensus government was then a regional, a minister for regional affairs. And then Binaisa was picked. The fact of the matter is that people say he was kidnapped from his home, taken to state house, and was sworn in as the president. However, soon the seven uh, deposited Binaisa uh, and chaired a council of three that led Uganda for some time and it took us to the 1980 election. He had quickly fitted uh, up a political vehicle, UPM, which participated in the elections for only the participating. I think we were looking around for justification for a war, the so-called liberation war. Indeed, after the highly disputed election, the man who said it to have won the election, Dr. Paulo Kanga, on side of parliament. But Museveni, together with 26 others, 27 others, 
decided to wage a war against Obote's government. And it was this war that was later baptized the Uganda Liberation War, running between 1980 to 1986 in January. But that look back at 1980, 1990s, and then the 2020s, we, we get to know that the world is liberated. And the world is liberated. And the word deliberated is just a misnomer. Because fighters are driven by only one nation to attain power. Of course, because they want to be braced by the masses, they start all the people's problems. And when Seven took over power, he said what he had happened in Uganda was not just a change of God, but a fundamental change. 35 years later, I'm addressing you while seated in a wheelchair. A wheelchair for people with spine injury. And I was beaten up in the parliament by soldiers in the parliament during constitution and exercise. If the speaker of parliament had not accepted to betray us, I don't believe that she would be alive. Most probably she would be dead. The violence I saw on that day, in less than 20 minutes, my back had been broken. And I will call it Three in France because I lost it. Three, number, number five, number four, and number three. And this is a permanent state. That is how we are in the constitution by violence. Obote is reported to have violated the constitution of Uganda between 1966 and 1967. But the worst he did was to read the constitution and the late parliament passed it when all the members in the house didn't have a copy. And it is also said that near by and over choppers, military choppers were flying around the parliament. With Museven, it was not having soldiers in the nearby area, but it was having them inside the parliamentary chambers, grabbing and beating up MPs. And all this battle, all this violence, was because Museveni, under the constitution of Uganda written by himself, was, had, was not qualifying to be a candidate in the 2021 election. So he came to parliament, made that, go to other MPs with millions of money, suppress the masses, attack villages, turn, turn the Kampala into a war zone just because you wanted us to remove the age limit. You have been so kind. They let him say when he tell his age. He says he doesn't know when he was born. But he believes that, you see, because it was the name of the Museven, it must have been somewhere when people from the seventh battalion in the first world war were coming back. And that you he, he's saying, most probably I was born around that time because that is how I got this name Museven. However, recently he told the country that by the way, my name is not Museven. My true names are for 35 years, he had deluded the country. The Ugandans did not know his name. Recently, when he attacked the younger presidential candidate, Chagulani, and that's his document, through proxies, 
And you know, Kyagulani, the useful fighter he is, also got a lawyer to go to the director commission and say, I also want to access Museveni's academic papers. This is when the president was kind to tell us that the fact of the matter is that Museveni, no, it is not my name. My true name is Kimuhabura. Of course, people say, partly he did this uh, to prominently on the ballot paper because there is no civic education here. The location of the candidate on a, a, a ballot paper is also very important. So Mr. Museveni is the ever the last man below on the ballot paper. So they will tell the typically incompetent voters that you can vote for the voter who appears last with the heart. So one day when we get somebody called the Zakaria here standing as a president, Museveni will say, I'm Zephania with double Z. To be able to keep that name, appearing, his name appearing last. But those are the simple things. Honestly, as not, the liberator who liberated Uganda in 1986 on the 26th of January, 1986, has done exactly what Amin did and brought it together and worse. So like I told you, that if Obote brought soldiers near parliament when he was changing in the constitution, Museveni took the army inside the chambers and he almost killed MPs. I, just, I personally, I just live by the mass of God. They had sentenced me to death when they did it to me. And I had to travel up to India to get a surgery. However, up to now, I'm still living in pain. Of course, we have now removed all the limitations in the constitution, which would ban me something from standing. There is only one limitation now remaining. That is, that you're not God. The way God eliminates the people, maybe. But he has also a grand plan for that. Because Uganda is steadily turning into a presidential monarchy. The president is stunned, is ready and prepared. He's a crown prince here. There's no doubt about that. He commands a full section of the army, elite, highly equipped personnel recruited by himself. The day he joined the army, Uganda tried to protest and seven told them that his son was just a kind man who had enrolled into the local defense forces, NODUs. In so short a time, this LODU was in the Sandy House now. Gaddafi visited us and he, he declared him a major. Since then, he has been, he has been promoting his son, and today he's a general. It is very clear that this is uh, the prince here appellate. So, you see, Museven also has the plan. That is that in case of death, I'll be succeeded by my son. So where is the liberation? There's no liberation. There's no liberation because of the country in Uganda. We need another liberator to go back for war to liberate Uganda. If it were not for men like a Dr. Kawanga Semongere, Dr. Kila Besige, Honare Bochagulani Lobat, and he asked us all to commit ourselves to a non-violent struggle against the dictatorship. Uganda would be at war right now. I would be a general, general numbers, commanding or a warlord somewhere. But we, we, we decided and we chose deliberately to follow. The great minds like Mahatma Gandhi, the Martin Luther, Mandela, who chose 
who chose nonviolence over violence. And I know there, in that, lies the answer for all these issues to do with liberation and the liberators. That the people remain the pillar of democracy and freedom. It must be the people. It must be the people. But these people need to be empowered. This should no longer be an issue for some people in a small country in Uganda. We live on the same planet. How come that one man, remember by the time he went to war, we were at 12 million Ugandans, but she and 27 others took us to war. In that war, we lost over 500,000 people and the unexpected and a valid number of properties. They broke into banks to facilitate the people. They killed the people, calling them enemies. And the, at the end of the day, the man who killed more people than the other, he might be the winner. And Mahatma Gandhi said, and I want to end on this note, by quoting Mahatma Gandhi, he said, that democracy broke through bloodshed and violence will always be contaminated by the time it reaches the people. That you can only deliver democracy and freedom when you are coming while well, jumping the bodies to set out. That you are accompanied by dead bodies to set out like himself, he was accompanied by a half million dead people to state out. And Mahatma Gandhi said, if you do that, the democracy, the freedom, the peace, the security, the justice you are pretending to deliver will be contaminated. Thank you. Thank you, Betty, for, for that amazing um, overview and, and for your continued courage. Um, you, you inspire truly all of us. And thanks for everyone for sticking with us. We're having some, some technical difficulties across the board. I think we'll try Manuel. If you can hear us one more time in, in Mozambique. Manuel, are you, are you with us? It does not appear so. So I think what we'll do right now, uh, Nick, is we'll turn this discussion over to you uh, as today's mm. discussant uh, and to Nicole. Uh, we'd love to get your thoughts on these topics. Of course, you both studied these issues in depth for, for a number of years now, but also Nick uh, to check in on our WhatsApp channel to see what questions we have received for today's speakers. I, I think we've had quite a few come in. So Nick, uh, on over to you, take it away. Absolutely, it was fantastic to hear these different perspectives from different countries. We've already heard from South Africa, Zimbabwe, Uganda. Hopefully we'll get an uh, insight from Mozambique soon. But while we're trying to sort that out, I want to come to Nicole, who's got great insights into this, not least because she's done research in a number of different countries. Um, and of course, she's South African herself. Uh, so Nicole, I'm just going to throw the floor over to you for a moment before I start channeling some of the questions we've got on the WhatsApp group. What's, what struck you from the conversation so far? Fabulous. Thanks, Nick. So um, I think it's been a fascinating conversation and uh, I've been privileged to uh, know the politics of, of these places quite uh, intimately. But I think these are questions that we think about a lot um, on the African continent where we have, you know, uh, probably close to a dozen, if not more, liberation regimes. Um, and we see them sort of retreat into ever more undemocratic means of maintaining themselves in power. And I think this sort of lends itself to, in my mind, to two ideas, really, um, two threats that liberation regimes face. And those two threats are time and succession. So I think everything we've talked about, and, and I think Jay brought this out really nicely, is that um, liberation movements in power initially derive their legitimacy from a kind of history of, of fighting for a cause uh, that is seen to be broadly legitimate. And in their, in the eyes of the population, at least initially, uh, and to some or other degree, I think, I think Betty did an excellent job of talking a bit about how uh, the liberation in, in Uganda maybe is not 
quite so straightforward. But in terms of this legitimacy that comes from a, a liberation struggle, that declines uh, day by day. So the further that a country gets away from that period of liberation, the more difficult it becomes to sustain this history um, as a legitimizing force of, of an administration. So what I was thinking about is something that I think a lot of people touched on, um, which is the question of born freeze. You know, what happens when uh, the young become old enough to vote? What happens when those who, who uh, don't have a direct memory of, of the liberation struggle are old enough to vote and then start to question why there are no jobs, why unemployment is so high, why the deal that they've got is so raw. And I see Maureen nodding, but I think this is particularly poignant in, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa. So I think Jay talked a little bit about um, the questioning of Mandela's legacy and, and people now are calling him a sellout. But I think, you know, South African born frees have forgotten the era between 1990 and 1994 when at least 14,000 people were killed uh, in violence. And it was an incredibly difficult and desperate situation that only negotiation could really address. But, you know, born frees have forgotten that period of violence um, and what it did to rip the country apart. So the further that a country gets from this period of liberation, the more difficult it, it becomes to sustain that legacy. So if we think about the youth protests in Ethiopia that had that brought down the TPLF that uh, led to the appointment of, of Abiy Ahmed in uh, 2018, or if we think about the born freeze in Zimbabwe, which joined the MDC because ZANU-PF's style of governance no longer suited uh, the country's needs and, and was starting to erode the country's economy. Again, if we think about NN the NRM and Museveni, I, I think Betty was giving some really good examples about how um, you know, the, the promises made in 1986 have not been fulfilled. And I think we can see that in as much as there are now um, you know, two thirds of uh, the voting public in, in Uganda is under the age of 30 and none of them have this direct memory of this war that killed so many people. So young people are likely the greatest threat to, uh, to the maintenance of these liberation regimes. Unless as Maureen was saying, um, the government can try to continue to claim a legacy of liberation into the future to say, this is an unfinished project and only the liberation mm -hmm. movement can finish mm -hmm. this project. And I think that's something we see across all of these cases. And then finally, the second thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is uh, succession, because I think this question was raised in many ways. Um, I think that Jay made a really interesting point when he talked about politically, parties want to maintain themselves in power. Uh, that is what they do. Um, and I think that's true. But how does a party maintain itself in power the further it gets from this history of liberation uh, that brought them to power. And the question around that is that often it, it comes down to strong men rather than strong institutions, as, as Betty Namboze pointed out. So we tend to have very personalized struggles in places like Zimbabwe with President Robert Mugabe, with um, you know, Yari Museveni in, in Uganda, across the continent, these struggles become incredibly personalized and the institutions themselves are eroded. I think potentially the one exception to that is, is the South African case. But what happens when, um, when succession politics gets in the way? We saw in, uh, in Zimbabwe where President Mugabe tried to bring in his, his wife, Grace Mugabe, to replace him. And he was deposed uh, by the now president, Emerson Mangagwa, who one might argue um, his legacy might be judged more harshly than, than President Mugabe's. And, and as Betty was saying, you know, we're, we're looking at the, the potential succession in, in Uganda of uh, Mohozi Kanyugaba. And so you start to see that the party personalizes the struggle, partly because those who struggled don't want to give up power. Um, I remember in South Africa, there was an outcry 
when a man called Smatsun Gonyama, who was uh, very close to President Mbeki, said, I didn't join the struggle to be poor. And that, that <laughs> for me, um, sort of emphasizes a lot of what, what happens when liberation movements get into power is it becomes a self-legitimating question. You know, we didn't lose friends or go into exile or suffer extreme violence in order to lose the power that we've gained, in order to lose our access to resources. So that's when we see the kind of uh, the erosion of democratic norms, um, when the succession question collides with the, the question of time. So I think those are my reflections. Um, and I think it's been a really fascinating and, and thought provoking conversation. Nick. Thanks, Nicole. That's, that's fantastic. I'm going to throw all that back to our speakers in just a minute, but I'm going to throw it back with an additional question. We've had loads of questions uh, from uh, Namibia, from Angola. We've got a couple of questions from the UK and a couple of questions from the US. And one of the things that's kind of coherent to a lot of the questions is, you know, to what extent did the liberation movements that we're actually talking about speak about democracy when they were fighting? Um, you know, I've written about this a little bit in my book, Democracy in Africa. If you look back for a lot of liberation movements, they talk about freedom. They don't always clearly articulate a version of democracy when they're fighting. It's often freedom from oppression, freedom from poverty, in some cases, freedom from minority rule, freedom from colonialism. It's not always a clearly articulated understanding of, of democracy. And I suppose one of the questions I want to ask is, to what extent does that, you know, the lack of articulation of that of that vision of democracy, perhaps constrain then, the you know, the extent to which people feel they have to stay committed to democratic values when they're in power. The second bit of that that I want to ask, which has come up again by another couple of questions, is how much does the way that these movements are actually organised? leads to different kinds of politics. So, you know, we know that some liberation movements, some rebel groups have taken territory, and when they take territory, they try and build those people into the group. They try and win them over, educate them, share their food with them, and have a model that perhaps is more democratic in terms of their relationship with those communities. And we know that other, you know, rep, uh, liberation movements have been much more brutal, taken a much more violent attitude, tried to be much less inclusive of the territories that they've held during the civil conflict itself. And I also wonder to what extent that, you know, shapes this, because that in a sense is setting up a system of rebel governance before you've even moved and won the state and set up your new democracy. And of course, some of those pathologies are likely to then bleed in. So the, what I'd like to throw back to our panel is, first of all, Nicole's comments. Second, that thought about to what extent was, was democracy part of the narrative? Um, thirdly, this question of, you know, to what extent does the organization of the movement when it was fighting actually shape this? And finally, you know, a number of people are asking you all, what happens next, right? What's, what's next? What actually happens when these systems start to break down? So let's imagine that every liberation movement we're talking about right now starts to fragment. Let's imagine that those cracks in the ANC become a formal split or Museveni can't manage the NRM, etc. What actually comes next? Is there a way that that can evolve in a more democratic way rather than a more conflictual way? Now, Manuel, we haven't been able to get through to you yet, but I'm hoping that you can speak now so that we can come to you and give you the floor. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm really sorry for this technical for this technical problem. But uh, finally, I, I I managed, and uh, let me say hi to my sister from Uganda. We have been walking these roads together in several. We attended several conferences and meetings discussing these issues over the day the here. And, and also, you know, it's really a pleasure to be today here to share and learn from colleagues and share our own experience and to be with those veterans like Mr. Naido, who we heard from them in books, uh, newspapers, but today, you know, we have this opportunity and the privilege, if not actually an honor to be on the same panel. I mean, coming to Mozambique, uh, I would like to start by differentiating, though some people say that this differentiation is quite uh, artificial, 
in the way different countries in Africa were colonized. I mean, I'm trying to say, I mean, to bring here the example of some countries which were had what was so-called uh, indirect rule and direct rule. So like we have the Portuguese, we have the English, and uh, we have the France who colonized several countries. As, as we know, in 1885, 1886, there was the Berlin Conference, which divided pieces of Africa, giving to different uh, colonial powers. And the way they colonized also, it influenced the nature of the liberation movements in different parts of the continent. So for example, if you look at the Portuguese, for example, you look at uh, Guinea-Bissau, Angola, and Mozambique, because of the nature of the colonizer, where, for example, in Portugal, during the 30s, 40s, 60s, he, until 1974, in the 70s, they, Portugal didn't enjoy democracy. So there were, we had uh, a dictatorship in Portugal. So it was in, in, inimaginable that the freedom movement could emulate democracy or could have democracy at their core because of the nature of the colonizer. Of course, for the English, uh, though we cannot say that it was like a more, a, a kind of a more benevolent kind of colonial, but <laughs> at least with, with, with their indirect rule, they invested on the local elite. And then they invested some, if you follow like, for example, the biography of uh, some of the post-colonial leaders, you will see that mo most of them came from the former ruling elites. Then when we, this also influenced the strategies that uh, freedom parties or movements followed. For example, for the Portuguese, because there was a dictatorship regime in Europe, in, in, in Portugal, they had to follow an armed struggle, which actually added the stance, the management style, and uh, pushed them to, uh, to the advent because during the 60s and during the 70s, we had also the advent of the Cold War. So there was mm. an, the world was divided into the free world and the communist world. So some of these move, move, movements were inspired and uh, they also, because of the way the West treated some of these move, movements, they had somehow like a kind of no alternative between commerce than to go and ask support either to China or to socialist countries. These influenced their modus op operandi. And for example, for the case of the post-colonial uh, co independence move movement in the Portuguese former colonies, they were supported in their struggle for independence, either by China, for the example of, of UNITA in Angola, or from the Soviet Union, which made them embrace that ideology. So from the inception and even in the development of the struggle, their model was not that much, it was freedom, yes, but it was not democracy in that sense. So it uh, ended up influencing. So it was easier for them after independence to follow the, the, the Soviet model. For, for the case of Mozambique, it was two years after the proclamation of independence in 1977 that the ruling party, Frelimo, decided at their third Congress to become mar formally Marxist-Leninist. From there, they banned the right of religion, the, the, they banned uh, most of the private pro property, they banned the freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, leading, leading them to a revolt, not only of the youth, but of the so society. Because by banning re religion, they excluded vast majority of people from embracing 
the route for to build the new country. So we ended up with a civil war, which started two years after independence in 1977. But this war was not only fueled by internal grievances, but also there was a regional contest because we had the illegal regime in Zimbabwe, I mean, then South Rhodesia, and then we had the ANC uh, and, uh, uh, fighting against apartheid in South Africa. So there were like three layers which uh, fueled this conflict. The first were like the internal conflicts because of the banning of the uh, freedoms of speech, of movement, of opinion, and so on, but also the policies of nationalization and so on. But at the regional level, we had the so-called uh, total strategy of Bota, Malan, and others on, in the apartheid re regime, which uh, united with Ian Smith in Southern Ro Ro Rhodesia, who were trying to protect their minority regimes against what they then called the onslaught of the, uh, 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 of the left led by the Soviet Union. But then at the international level, of course, we had the, the Cold War. So all these came together, both in Angola and Mozambique, fueling the civil war, which in the case of, of Mozambique only ended in 1992, uh, after uh, uh, a peace accord which was signed in Rome between the then rebel movement, Renamo, and uh, which, which converted itself from a military guerrilla movement into a political party. After 20 years of peace in, in Mozambique, another conflict started because the then Rome Accord was not being followed as was signed or as at least Renamo leaders thought that uh, they signed because the idea after the peace accord in Rome was to have democracy. Of course, uh, theoretically, we have a constitution which uh, is de democratic. I mean, all uh, the right of speech, of movement, and, and, uh, and, and, and of, of, of opinion is in the constitution. But the institutions still respect the former monoparty constitution. The institution did not move at the same speed as the, as, as the con, 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 constitution. We have a de facto monoparty system operating at all levels, while uh, theoretically we have a parliament, which actually is just a rubber stamp, but, or, and, and, and also we have a government which influences and actually mm -hmm. leads not only the parliament, but also the judiciary. So we don't have the separation of power. And actually with the last uh, mandate of uh, the current president, we had even state organized paramilitary forces called death squadron going after opposition leaders, killing them. Extra judicial killings came to be part of the game. And unfortunately, with, with, with the discovery of gas in the, in the, in the north of Mozambique, on, one, on what was going to be the biggest investment in Africa by total of over 60 billion, that investment unfortunately last week was suspended because of the actions of uh, jihadist youth. So disgruntled youth find in jihadism a kind of hope and response to their grievances because the post-colonial state in Mozambique was not was unable of articulating and is unable of responding to the demands and expectations of the youth. So today we have disgruntled youth joining jihadist extremist movements because of lack of, of because the post-colonial state, because the liberation party failed totally to respond to the demands and expectations of the people. So that, 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 that's where we are today. The whole country postponed 
all their dreams postponed and a huge amount of young people, women suffering because the post-colonial state was not able of understanding the nature of challenges that uh, were put at uh, their management. Thank you so much, Manuel, for that. You gave us actually a fantastic overview of the last sort of 40 years of, of history. Um, and I think you also ended on a point there that chimed really with something Nicole was talking about, about the role of young people and popular frustration and, and historical memory and the role of that in potential sort of instability in the future of liberation movement. So thank you so much. I'm now going to go to each of our other speakers very quickly because we you've all said so much, it's such a rich discussion, but we are running out of time. So I'm going to come to everyone for sort of one or two minute, please, response to what's been said, closing comments, remarks and so on. So I'm going to come to you first, Maureen, then I'll come to Betty, and then we'll sort of go in reverse order back to Jay, if that's okay. So Maureen, coming to you, final couple of thoughts on maybe what Nicole said or what you've heard from other speakers. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. I, I think quickly, Nicole speaks of uh, two threats uh, to liberation movements that are if, if tend authoritarian, which are opportunities for the uh, disenchanted majority who wants democracy. And she speaks of time and transition. But I think that um, while we take cognizance of those, we must also remember that the regime or the regimes are, are, are responding and in two ways. Number one, um, I think there's the issue to counter these two uh, things, time and, uh, and, 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 and transition, uh, the problematic uh, transitions that they are faced with. I think the first one is that they have captured the state and militarized it in a way that is very difficult. Even if uh, they run out of time, they're reproducing themselves somehow. And then the second thing is that um, they have used so much uh, propaganda in terms of trying to uh, reproduce, if you want, or to recycle a, a, a historical memory, which, which cannot be recycled. But really, like for example, in Zimbabwe, you have people who are being um, uh, recruited, young people who are bone freezes, Nicole speaks to, she says, what happens to the bone freeze? So we have bone freeze who are being recruited uh, to actually go to a national youth service where they are, then you know it told that the idea of uh, the liberation struggle has not been completed and we are passing the baton to you and we have the state which we have captured which we have militarized to assist you so i think in response what we need to do is that there must be a lot of support uh, towards civil society work to uh, you know conscientize the majority of the people that there is still a lot of opportunity and room to challenge uh, the militarization to challenge the state capture and also to challenge this new crop of, um, of, of young people who are being uh, recruited into the National Youth Service and who are being uh, uh, conscientized to think that they are carrying uh, forward the, the ideals or the liberation uh, legacy. I think that the, the issue of the legacy has been the problem uh, in, 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 in all states where um, the liberation movements are still in government. I think if you recall in 2017 in Zimbabwe, we actually had a war a military project where a coup was effected by people who were claiming to restore a legacy of uh, um, you know uh, anti-colonialism, if you want. People were saying we are restoring the legacy, but yet employing a very violent ways that uh, act against uh, the ideals of democracy that we are fighting for. So my parting short is that the majority of the people understand the dream that the majority of the people who went to the liberation war to fight, who are not part of the political elite, uh, held at that time. And they want to continue to fight for democracy, to make sure that the institutions work to protect people, to improve and to promote uh, equality. And for us, I think that we need, um, you know, a, within SADC, within the continent and globally, uh, support around civil society work to conscientize people um, on, on what they can and uh, what they can do to push uh, for a democratic transition to take place. I think that will be my parting shot that it's really uh, very difficult because of the militarization, because of um, you know, the threat to personal safety and security, but really we need to challenge um, the propaganda that is uh, the unfinished liberation uh, legacy or liberation uh, projects that some people have to uh, continue while 
uh, 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 violating other people's rights. All we need to do now is to promote and, and try and support civil society work towards um, inclusion and, uh, and multi-party democracy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marina. Militarization, intimidation. For a moment there, I thought you were talking about Uganda rather than Zimbabwe. So this is a very good <laughs> moment to go from you to Betty. Betty, over to you. Uh, well, I want to thank you. You are all very amazing people. And my brother from Mozambique, I would pick his submission and only remove the word Mozambique and replace it with Uganda. Uh, for record, uh, Uganda is now a country of about 40 million people. And we are the second youngest nation in the world. With unemployment standing at 65% among youth. And the nepotism, tribalism, and sectarianism running as official state policies, 35 years after being rebalanced, the figures are 15 billion US dollars in debt, 18 women dying every day in labor, 21 people murdered every day, that is according to the Uganda police. A highly oppressive government and an analogous head of state who treats the country as his personal property. It is also important to note that Uganda First Lady is also the Minister for Education. That in Parliament, I sit with 10 army men, presumably representing the army. And that people's efforts to seek for justice through courts of law has been frustrated. And in Uganda, we have rulings like this. In, when they were looking at the case of using violence to amend the constitution, the allowance the judges ruled that Betty Nambozi has been proved that Betty Nambozi and the others were beaten. And it is true that the biggest casualty of that attack was Betty Nambozi who lost her backbone. However, we advise the Nambozi to seek justice from the High Court for compensation. And we find that that violence was not executed in order to assist the amendment of the Constitution, but an attack on MPs individually. I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. And then we have a Supreme Court that rules that the elections were rigged. There are a lot of ships do agree that the elections were rigged, but not substantially enough to, to cause a defeat of the winner. So it's, it's like we go, courts of law have given up. And I want to tell you, even Parliament, where you sit, have turned into just a talk show platform. Our law as opposition, in the next parliament, we shall be about 160 MPs in parliament from the opposition. But because of gerrymandering, the NRM will always have the majority in parliament, over 300 MPs, all listening to one man in the parliament to execute the interests of one man. So we are definitely the minority in parliament. We don't have a say in the election of the speaker. It is as if everything is done deal. 
but I refuse to agree that the world is not able to do anything. I refuse to agree that the rest of the world needs an invitation card from the victims of the dictatorship in Uganda. I refuse to agree is that the, the world has left China to come into Africa and trade with dictators at the expense of the people. I think that the world is not helpless. We are talking about less than 300 people holding countries hostage. Just to see the action of United States of America with only one law, the Magnist law. Only that one action of waking up one morning and America, American government announcing that Santo is not welcome in America. Only that one action has turned out to be so important and holds the hope of people in Uganda. The world should, should drop the indifference. The world should stop respecting boundaries that are maintained to safeguard dictators. It is not about Uganda. It's not about Mozambique. It is not about Zimbabwe. It is about human beings. I don't think those countries that give Uganda loans here, to the extent that we now owe the world 15 billion US dollars, the fact is that the United States of America is sponsoring the army in Uganda. Should I say that the people in America, the taxpayers, paid their money to have me sit in the wheelchair for the rest of my life? Is the world so blind that it doesn't see the suffering of the people of Uganda? Should we wait for Uganda to turn into another Somalia for us to take interest? How many more people should be killed? Before other countries, even those that in the neighborhood here like Kenya, would say that we have seen enough in Africa, that we have seen enough in Uganda. This even is not an angel. It's not superhuman being. I don't think that these dictators who are holding us hostages cannot be interrupted by the international community. But Thanks, everybody please. is so busy. For example, I feel sad that because of COVID, many Ugandans have been killed by the army pretending to be enforcing COVID rules than those who have been killed by the disease. The disease, COVID, has killed less Ugandans than those who have been killed in the same period. Somebody chose to press an election just in the middle of the world crisis and then almost used the COVID to call himself the life president of Uganda. I don't, I'm not asking much from the world. Thanks, Betty. And I think but, what, but the, uh, what, I, what I want to say and the end to is, is if everybody would take care, if it would become a concern of everyone living, is that everywhere human beings reside. They need to be free. We are born free, and we should live free. And injustice anywhere, and dictatorship anywhere, dictatorship everywhere. 
Thank you, Betty. I think that's a sentiment we at the Resistance Bureau definitely agree with. And I think your comment there about the way in which leaders like Museveni hide behind sovereignty to get away with abusing their own people and shield themselves from the international community is something you know, we've heard from people speaking about many other countries. So thank you so much for reiterating that important point. Jay, I'm gonna to come to you to have the last word here. And I'm gonna throw in a, a cheeky, slightly different question, if I may, to your closing remarks, which is, all of the countries we're talking about here really hit the kind of peak of repression when the governments faced a significant opposition you know, and worried about losing power. We've not seen that yet in South Africa. The ANC hasn't had to face a potential election defeat. Are you completely confident that if the ANC had to face a possible election defeat, that we would see the ANC holding true to its democratic principles? Well, I don't think it's up to the ANC to decide that. You know, uh, it's up to the people of South Africa. And the one thing that, uh, you know, South Africans have is you can push us and push us and push us. And then at one point we say, we have had enough. And we don't care who's doing it, we will push back. And so that's the whole quest, the issue that I'm trying to, to, to tell people is that if we do not change, then change will come in spite of everything we do to stop it. And so for me, you know, I look at Africa and we have 54 countries in Africa defined by a colonial conference by our masters in Europe in 1884. And we still remain that. Fiefdoms de defined by colonialism and slavery and the massive exploitation uh, of, uh, of the African continent, its people, its resources, its land. And so that remains the same model. Now, if I look at democracy, you know, I mean, when we stood up to fight apartheid, our parents said, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the context where Mandela and the generation had gone to jail and people and thousands had left into exile, you know, there was a period of political repression, which our parents were terrified of talking about, you know, about politics. But in spite of their fear, we stood up. You know, they said, you'll get killed or you'll get tortured or you'll get detained. But an idea can never be killed. And, you know, Steve Biko was my inspiration at 15 years old. You know, the idea that you have nothing to lose but your chains because that's what it was. But the chains were largely mental change. But the mind was the main weapon in the hands of the oppressor because we were the majority. So I look at Africa, and, and I think Betty has been talking, all of us have been talking about how a narrow elite continues to manipulate power in the world. And that power has been accentuated by the digital revolution that has captured much of the internet space now, and we need to contest it. And this is what we're doing through, you know, programs like the Resistance Bureau. And so, I look at the arithmetic and say there are 1.3 billion Africans on our continent, 60% are under 25. So what's holding us back? You know, and that's a decision you have to make as an individual because it could have you know, consequences, but that's a choice you've got to make. And then you'll find like us in 1976, millions of other people are prepared to make the same choice then the majority finds its agency, it finds its voice, it finds its struggle, and it defines its destiny. So now the question is the generation that exists in Africa that is capable of change in any change in the history of humanity, usually is under 35. They're not elders like me going into the trenches. But what we need is an authentic intergenerational conversation where people like me who are elders are prepared to stand up and give aerial cover to those that are protecting our continent and wanting to build our continent in spite of the colonial boundaries. Now, liberation movements will always be hostile. Political parties are hostile. Any organization is hostile to anything new because new is threatening. It changes the status quo. People lose power. They stop being the gatekeepers to expect that they will voluntarily give up power. I mean, that's a bit 
naive. No one voluntarily gives power. Often, it has to be taken away from them. But it, hasn't, it can't be an elitist contestation. And this is where we have to go back to the people, go back to the grassroots and build mass struggles of people fighting for better education, for better health, for fighting for you know, the, their rights to protect the environment. And so I, if I had to, we have to change democracy. The idea of South Africa as, an, as a democracy based on one person, one vote, but in a proportional representation system is that it gives all power to the party bosses. Because the party bosses, not the people, decide who should be on the list of who goes to parliament. And then if you see parliament and government as where the power is, we miss out that real power sits with people if they are organized. So a lot of people say to me, oh, Jay, why did you leave politics? I say, I never left politics. I left government. I'm still much, very much a political activist. But we have to change the model of activism because this model that we're using up to now has failed us. It's become professionalized. It's become driven by philanthropic capital that diverts the focus of our attention on social justice and environmental justice to something about supporting, submitting reports and log frames to some donor sitting in as a bean counter and some air conditioned office in some Western capital, we've destroyed ourselves. And so we play into the hands of those who want to hold them to power by claiming, oh, you are just echoing the, you know, the voice of, the, of your colonial masters. Now they will do that. Does that stop us? It should never stop us. It should make us more determined. So I, there's three lessons I think I want to share with you in my party that I've learned and I missed. You know, one is putting Mother Earth, ecology, at the center of everything. The extractive model of rent-seeking elites in Africa has never benefited people of Africa. We walk on gold, diamonds, platinum, oil, gas. Tell me one example where any project has ever benefited people of Africa. Most of the gold sitting in Western vaults today comes from South Africa. Most of the gold that people wear on their fingers today as wedding rings and engagement rings comes from South Africa. Give me an example of how South Africans have benefited from that. So the model has failed. So should we worry about China getting involved in Africa? No, I will welcome the Chinese or the Indians or the Russians or the United States or whatever if they want to come. The question is, do we have an African agenda? We don't have an African agenda. We don't know what we want as Africans. In fact, we don't know what it means to be African because we seem to have, don't remember that Africa is the cradle of humanity, that Africa is where it created the first language, the first music, the first, you know, the first instruments of fire, of technology, of agriculture. We believe that we have no civilization beyond the shadow of the last 500 years of of, of colonialism and you know, extractive exploitation and slavery. We've erased ourselves. So we want to be a, a poor photocopy of some Western person or some Chinese person, some Indian person. So maybe the first question we should ask ourselves and Betty is talking to that is we should understand what it means to be African beyond that shadow and be proud to be that. And we have an indigenous knowledge that we should go back to that the world desperately needs today. So maybe putting ecology, when you talk to a person, and I'm talking a lot to indigenous communities, when you ask them where God is, they don't look in the sky. They look at the forest and they say, there's a spirit of the forest or the spirit of the desert or the spirit of the land. We respect the land as sacred. So maybe we should go back to our own indigenous cultures instead of trying to find some model that's failing all over the world. So that's the first thing. The second thing is patriarchy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to ask you to speed up a tiny bit, okay. Jake. So just because so the second time. thing is patriarchy. We have a toxic patriarchy that permeates everything we do from politics to family, to religion, to economy, to trade unions, to, we have to 
ensure that we see and support and nurture the rising sacred feminine. And it's more than just gender rights. It's about the role of women in shaping society and in the building an intelligent cooperation between men and women rather than a competition. And the third thing is what does it mean to be human? I have to go beyond this mind, beyond this intellect and beyond this body to understand that I am part of something deeply interconnected and indivisible, which is an energy. And if you go back to what it means to be African, that's what African mythology and you know, spirituality talks about, is we are just vibrations of energy that is part of an energy that connects everything that we, we share the planet with. And perhaps we should start to see that. And then that's when we start to see beyond division that we have created largely because of a toxic masculinity that has been put into place. And maybe that's the vision we need to go forward to not just heal Africa, but to heal the world. Thanks so much. I think that's a great point to end on and a really good point that, you know, being anti-colonial means going well beyond those kinds of inequalities and assumptions that were inherited to not just change, you know, parts of Africa or individual countries, but to take a challenge back to other countries elsewhere in the world about what they're doing. And I think that's absolutely right. That's genuine transformation long term. Thank you so much for ending on a really inspirational point. And with that, belatedly, sorry guys, but the discussion was too good. Um, I'm going to push it back to uh, Jeff and Mantade and say thanks again to Nicole for her fantastic comments there, which really stimulated a great discussion. Thank you so much, Nick. I mean, we could go on and on. There's so much to learn. And but the, the, the truth is that this is all the time that we have for today. So thank you so much to our viewers for tuning in. And thanks so much to our brilliant panel and to Nicole for joining us today. Our entire team looks forward to keeping in touch with all of you and to keep tracking and highlighting your important work as we move ahead. In the meantime, you can keep up to date with the Resistance Bureau by visiting our website, www.theresistancebureau.com and subscribing to our newsletter there. We also encourage you to follow our social media platforms on Twitter and on Facebook, as well as Instagram and YouTube. We really hope that you continue to join us in those important discussions as we continue to bring to you some of Africa's brilliant and, dyna and dynamic thought leaders. So the final note putting this show together would never be possible if it wasn't for the teamwork that continues to bring us to life. So thank you so much to our advisory council and a special shout out to our colleagues, Peter Dory and Donham Saga, who are working hard behind the scenes to make this show a success. So from myself, Mandat and Loja and my co-host Jeffrey Smith, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Keep safe, keep fighting the good fight and we will definitely see an Africa that works for us all. Thank you. Thanks everyone.